Hi friends, and welcome to lesson three in our chemistry video series. Uh, lesson three is gonna be about phases of matter and how we go between different phases of matter. And we're gonna look at some of the specific chemistry related to particular phases of matter, uh, especially gases. So let's go back to the course organization Prezi just to kind of see where we are, and then we'll come back in and we'll start talking. So here we are again at the course organization Prezi, and just a reminder, you can go and you can play with this whenever you want. But remember that our overall theme for the year is that matter is made of atoms that interact in interesting ways. And so our first two units really deal with large amounts of matter in the aggregate and seeing how that behaves. In unit two, we dealt with matter and energy and looked at the interactions between them. And here in unit three, we're going to look at how we go between different phases of matter, things like solids, liquids, and gases. So you're probably familiar with the fact that there are different phases of matter already. We're really only going to focus on the three major phases of matter that we see on this planet, which of course are solids, liquids, and gases. There are other phases of matter, particularly plasma, which of course is the state that matter exists in things like the sun, but we don't really need to worry too much about those phases of matter for the purpose of this course, for the simple fact that in our everyday lives, we really don't interact with those kinds of matter too much. The major thing to understand when we deal with the phases of matter is we need to understand that there are attractions not only inside of substances, the kind of bonds that hold molecules of a substance together, but also between molecules of a substance. That's what we call intermolecular attractive forces, which I will shorthand to IMAFs going forward. And these are just the forces that hold the individual particles of a substance together in a particular phase. This is one example of an intermolecular attractive force. There's an electrical charge difference between the hydrogen hydrogen and the chlorine in these molecules of HCl. And so as a result, opposite charges attract and that contributes to a force that holds these substances together. This is by no means the only intermolecular attractive force type. It's just one example of an intermolecular attractive force. When we consider the different phases of matter, we need to understand that the phase that a particular substance is at a particular temperature is due to a balance between the kinetic energy of the particles of that substance and the strength of the intermolecular attractive forces of that substance. So as we go from solid to liquid to gas, we'll notice that the kinetic energy of the particles is increasing, particularly with respect to the intermolecular attractive forces that hold those particles together. And if we go in the other direction, we'll see that the kinetic energy is decreasing with respect to those intermolecular attractive forces. So now that we have an understanding of that, let's go in and look at the three main Major phases of matter. We'll start with solids and go up through gases. So in a solid, if we consider the particles arranged as a particle diagram, you can kind of see what I've drawn over here. Now, of course, it would be a three-dimensional structure. We're somewhat limited by the nature of presentations. The particles in a solid are arranged in a regular three-dimensional structure. It's a geometric pattern that we call a crystal lattice. So whenever you hear this phrase crystal lattice, they are referring to a solid. It's not uncommon to think that the particles in a solid are not moving at all. And of course, if you look at this picture, they're not moving at all. But in reality, particles are constantly moving at any temperature above absolute zero. In a solid, because their particles are locked into that regular three-dimensional arrangement, they can only vibrate. So we describe their motion as vibrational. A solid, of course, has a definite shape and a definite volume. It will not take the shape of any container that it's in, for instance. When we consider a liquid, we can see that the particle arrangement has changed. The particles are no longer in that regular three-dimensional structure, but they are still very close together. This is obvious if you go and you look at a glass of water, for instance. All the particles will be still in very close contact at the bottom of that glass. It's common for students to think that there's a lot of space between the particles of a liquid, but of course that's not actually true. So it'd be a good idea to get that out of your brain space as we're talking right now. When we consider how the particles of a liquid are moving, not only are they vibrating, but they're also moving past each other and rotating around. So we said they have vibrational motion. We said they have translational motion, similar to how we translate an object on a graph, right? We move it from one side to the other. And that they have rotational motion, similar to how we would rotate an object on a graph, if you want to think about it that way. In terms of their shape and their volume, liquids no longer have a definite shape. They'll take the shape of whatever container they're in, but they do still have a definite volume. That volume is not going to change as the temperature of that liquid changes, at least in any really noticeable way. Because the particles of a liquid are all moving around, it is not uncommon for individual particles to get enough kinetic energy to transition into the gas phase by themselves. 
That's what we call evaporation, which just refers to the movement from a liquid to a gas below a substance's boiling point. We're going to talk a lot more about boiling in another lesson, but for right now you should just understand that particles of a liquid can and do evaporate. When we think about the particles of a gas, we now can see that their particles are arranged not only irregularly, but there's also quite a bit of space between these particles. Actually, to draw this to scale, I would have had to make these individual gas particles considerably smaller because they have considerably more space between them. But still, for the purpose of a model, I think we can understand what we're looking at. The particles are, of course, moving. They have vibrational motion. They have translational motion. They have rotational motion. But we like to think about a gas as traveling in random straight lines, basically just moving in a random line until they hit something and then transitioning to moving in another random line all the way around. When they hit each other or when they hit the walls of a container that they're in, we say that they have elastic collisions. What that means is that all of the energy that they bring into that collision, they leave with. This of course is not really how collisions work, but it's still how we like to envision the particles of a gas moving at most temperatures. The shape is of course indefinite and now as well, the volume is indefinite. The volume is going to expand to fill whatever container it's in and it's going to be affected by the pressure under which we put the gas. One thing that is important to understand is that gas particles are moving directly proportional to the kinetic energy of those particles. So the speed of the gas particles will always depend upon the temperature that that gas is being held at. When we consider the processes by which we move between solids and liquids and gases, we do need to have an understanding of each of these terms. So the movement from a solid to a liquid is melting, and the movement from a liquid to a solid is freezing. We might also call melting fusion, and we might also call freezing solidification. The movement from a liquid to a gas is known as vaporization. That's going to cover both evaporation and boiling. And the movement from a gas to a liquid, you probably know, is called condensation. You should also understand that it is not unheard of for substances to go directly from the solid to the gas phase or vice versa. This again is a function of the intermolecular attractive forces that hold those particles together. Movement from a solid to a gas is called sublimation and movement from a gas to a solid is called deposition. The classic example of a substance that does this is carbon dioxide, what we call dry ice when it's a solid. At atmospheric pressure, dry ice will transition from a solid directly into a gas or vice versa, depending upon the temperature that the substance is being held at. It's definitely a good idea to start to think about the energy that's involved when we move through the different phases. Going from solid to liquid to gas is going to be an energy investment process, what we call an endothermic process. Of course, going in the opposite direction is going to remove heat from the substance, and so that's going to be an exothermic process. Does all of this make sense? You absolutely need to be familiar with each of these terms. If you have any questions about them, please take a moment and write them down, and then let's move on. When we want to look at the relationship between pressure and temperature and the phase that a particular substance is in, we have a couple of different ways to do it. In our next lesson, we'll talk about heating curves and cooling curves. But what you see here is an example of what we call a phase diagram. This is going to show us the phase that a particular substance is in at a particular temperature and pressure. And you'll often get this shape that you see here, this sort of forked line shape as a substance goes between solids and liquids and gases. One thing to point out here is what's called the triple point of the substance. That's the point where all three phases exist simultaneously. This is the phase change diagram for water, and you can see his triple point illustrated down on the lower left of the diagram. When a substance goes through a phase change, at its point where it is going through that change, it exists in what we call a phase equilibrium. That's where both phases of the substance are present at the same time. Equilibrium is a term that we'll see a whole bunch in chemistry. It refers to any time that the rates of two different processes are equal. Phase equilibrium refers to the rates of substances transitioning from one phase into the other and vice versa. These exist at a substance's characteristic melting point and boiling point. So for instance, this diagram is showing us a liquid gas equilibrium. If this was water, this would exist at 100 degrees Celsius or 373 degrees Kelvin. For every particle that becomes a liquid, one is going to become a gas and vice versa. If we were to take water and get it to 100 degrees Celsius and put it in a stoppered container, so that the vapor could not escape into the atmosphere and leave it, we would see no increase in the amount of liquid water or in the amount of steam because those two processes exist at equilibrium. It's only by continuing to put heat in that we drive that equilibrium all the way to the steam direction or by continuing to take heat out that we drive that equilibrium all the way to the liquid direction. 
So that's it for this video. I hope that you have a better understanding of the phases of matter and the ways that we can move between the different phases. We're going to investigate that in more detail over the next couple of videos, but for right now, let's make sure you can do each of the following. Make sure that you can explain the relationship between a substance's kinetic energy and its intramolecular attractive force strength in relation to its phase. Make sure that you can describe the properties of solids, liquids, and gases, both in terms of their shape and their volume and their particle movements, and that you can represent their particle arrangements as particle diagrams. Make sure that you can identify phase changes when you see them occurring. If you're shown different representations of particles, you should be able to identify the phase that they're in. And finally, make sure that you can interpret those phase diagrams. If I give you a temperature and a pressure and a phase diagram, can you tell me whether we're at a phase change or what particular phase of matter we should expect to be in? If you can do each of those things, you're doing great. If not, take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave your questions in the comments below the video, or you can always contact me through the information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.